Okay, John chapter 16, as we pick up where Pastor left us off. <coughs> as we briefly just sort of review, John chapter 16, verse 22, uh, the idea here that Jesus has been leaving with his disciples is he's, he's been telling his disciples, hey, I'm going to leave you, but it's a good thing. Now, in our fleshly minds, we say, you're leaving? And the disciples are saying exactly that. You're leaving, and that's a good thing? Are you kidding me? But Jesus has also promised, he said, my Father, I will ask my Father, and my Father will bring the Holy Spirit. As Pastor taught us last time, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Teacher. Sounds pretty good, huh? So therefore, in verse 22, Jesus goes on, Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Now from these verses here, we can realize and understand that Jesus is saying, hey, you've got hope. And hope is a wonderful thing. In Psalm chapter 31 verse 24 the psalmist is saying be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart all you who hope in the Lord hope in the Lord when we have our hope in the Lord it does not disappoint amen, amen. and we're grateful for that Paul in Romans chapter 5 tells us exactly that hope does not disappoint so we're Bookmarks from either end knowing that our hope and our joy is in the finished work of Christ. And that's what motivates us to live accordingly. And so, once again, Jesus is telling the disciples, hey guys, I'm going to leave, but it's a good thing. But in their fleshly minds, they're just thinking, how can this be a good thing? And so Jesus, as we pick him up in verse 25 here, is going to begin to explain this in a little greater detail. Let's, let's move forward in verse 25. So Jesus speaking, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. Now when I was looking at these verses, I didn't like this. I, I couldn't quite get my hand around this idea of figurative language. And so when I kind of delved into it, asked the Lord to help me out with this, this word, I, I came up with something that helped me understand it a little bit. And, and the idea here is Jesus was saying that I've been speaking to you in Proverbs and, and parables. And so that helped me with this idea of figurative language. I've been speaking to you in parables. But Jesus goes on, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. So he says, the time will come. It's not at this moment, but it's coming. And so, figurative language or a parab parabolic language, or I have spoken to you of heavenly things using earthly language. How does anybody relate heavenly realities with earthly language? Pretty difficult, wouldn't you say? I mean, the Apostle Paul, as he had his experience in the third heaven, came back into his, into his mind and just said, you know, it would be a sin if I even tried to explain what I've just experienced. In other words, I don't have the capability in earthly language to even come close. I would pervert the whole idea. And so the Apostle Paul says, I'm not even going to bother and so here Jesus, fully man but fully God, is relating heavenly realizations to his disciples, but also he's limited by his earthly language. Secondly, he's limited by their limited thinking. They're thinking in the flesh. Once again, hey, I'm leaving, guys, but it's good for you. What do you mean? That's not a good thing. So they're not looking at this in a spiritual realm. So there's no way that we can delve into spiritual subjects with an earthly or a fleshly mind. Now, rightfully so, while Jesus was with his disciples, and we've seen quite clearly, the disciples constantly inquired 
of Jesus. Wisely so, amen. I mean, Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, he was on the scene and he had answers for these men's questions. But interestingly, I mean, the, the guys asked him, well, hey, Lord, what are we going to do about this? Or how can we deal with that or, or the other thing? And Jesus was giving answers and such. But then in Luke chapter 11, interestingly enough, the disciples asking Rabbi Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. That's an interesting request. Teach us to pray. But it gives us a bit of insight if we take a moment and look it over a little bit. And so Jesus responds in Luke chapter 11. He says, hey, I'll teach you to, to pray to the Father. Now, is this a new concept, praying to the Father? Now, Luke 11, of course, is, is a New Testament writing. But is this a, a, a new idea, pray to the Father? Well, the early patriarchs, as we clearly see in the book of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these men had a relational, a personal relational understanding of who Jehovah God was, who Yahweh was. They understood that. They understood, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob understood that their heavenly father was their father. Well, how is it that these New Testament guys are saying, hey, teach us to pray. Well, I'm going to teach you how to pray to the Father. And they kind of shook their head. What are you talking about? I mean, this is something that has been well established. Isn't it interesting that when Moses was present among the people, the people fixed their gaze on their leader? Fine. Not a problem. But the moment Moses temporarily left the people, the children of Israel immediately abandoned their worship of God. We remember after Moses was gone, the, the people came to Aaron right away, the spiritual leader. Hey, Aaron, Moses is gone. We don't know where he's at. We need something to worship. We need an idol. And Aaron said, okay. What happened here? In other words, if the children of Israel were not babysat, they would immediately wander. And you know what? If it happened to the children of Israel, I hate to say it, it's going to happen to us. And we better be very careful. Very careful. The children of Israel's faith was posted solely on the presence of Moses. Moses was on the scene, not a problem. Moses takes an exit for a temporary time. All bets are off. Their faith, their faith was posted solely on the presence of Moses, not on an intimate relationship with God the Father. If that's where you're at today, Today's your day. You get to correct that. If your faith is posted solely on this pulpit, this fellowship, whatever the case may be, today's the day that you can enter into that personal relationship with God the Father, and it's found through Jesus Christ. And so that's so today is your day. Now later on in the Old Testament era, as the sacrifices were required, I say required, of the children of Israel. We see that people sacrificed out of obligation. They were required to sacrifice. If they didn't sacrifice, the stick came out. Okay? They rarely sacrificed out of relationship, and unfortunately, fellowship was lost. Their focus of communing with Jehovah God was through the sacrifice. The focus of having a personal relationship was watered down and even perhaps dismissed by the majority of the chosen spiritual leaders of the day. Now a nation is in bad shape when its spiritual leaders are dismissing an intimate personal relationship with God. Spiritually, we're in, we're in big trouble. Big. Now let's fast forward back to the disciples. 
Surely these young Jewish men were keeping the regulations and requirements of the law. I don't have a problem with that. They showed up at Passover. They showed up when they were supposed to show up. Not a problem. But inside their hearts, they had to have known they had no relationship. They were coming out of obligation. But they desired relationship. And so, Rabbi Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray because we're at a deficit right now. We're going through all the motions and we're doing all the ins and outs. But you know what? We don't have relationship. We know that. We're being honest. I mean, these guys are being honest with Jesus. And so the first thing Jesus taught them was to rekindle their relationship. Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. Sure. Teach us to pray. Pray directly to Jehovah God, Jesus was saying. Yes. Approach Him. God, our Father. Approach Jehovah. Give God, Jehovah God, Yahweh, the honor that is due to Him. And give Yahweh the reverence He deserves. Address Him as our Father. Now, can you imagine the guys, they were just shaking their heads saying, what? We've never really heard this. We've, we've not been taught this. And Jesus says, hey, soon you will be taught to confidently speak directly to your heavenly Father. That's what Jesus is setting up here. We're starting to unfold and understand what these, these final verses of chapter 16 mean. Jesus is saying, hey, a time's going to come that you're going to worship in spirit and in truth, as we saw Jesus laying this out to the woman at the well. And so this is a theme that John has been carrying out throughout his gospel writing. Hey, you're going to have a personal relationship with God the Father. Things are about to change. But what about the sacrifices we have to ask? What about the sacrifices? Hey, they will soon be fulfilled. Jesus has been telling this group and those around him, I'm going to the cross, but they didn't understand. Jesus knew why he was going to the cross. He looked beyond the horror of the cross to see what? You and I. Jesus understood that, but the guys in their fleshly thinking, they didn't understand what was going on. What? Going to the cross, you're going to die. Oh, far be it from you, for you, Jesus, to go and die on the cross. Hey, Satan, get behind me. I'm going to the cross, and I'm going to lay down my perfect sacrifice for your open door. Wow. What an amazing thing. But with a fleshly sense of mind, we don't have a clue to what's going on. Oh, please don't go, don't go, please. That's the fleshly mind thinking. The Holy Spirit, the teacher, comes on the scene in Acts chapter 2. And with the teacher on the scene, and don't misunderstand, God, God the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Okay, don't misunderstand. He wasn't just now, the Holy Spirit just didn't arrive at, on Acts chapter 2. Don't misunderstand me. God the Holy Spirit is omnipresent but he has been revealed, so to speak, in Acts chapter 2. He's been revealed. Isn't it often sometimes when the Lord reveals himself to you, like perhaps right when you're in the middle of a, a freeway battle, shaking your fist, ah, oh, you bum. And all of a sudden the Lord says, oh, why don't you go give him the gospel now? And you think, how you doing? <laughs> One way. I'm out of here. I mean, you just blew your witness. God busted me on that one time in a, in a gas station type thing, and I, I was having a tough day. And I yelled out my window, and the minute those words came out of my mouth, the Lord just whispered in my ear and said, go ahead and witness to that guy now. I was busted. <laughs> because the things that I was saying before were not edifying. I mean, I wasn't cussing or anything. I was like, hey, man, what's the deal? You know, my voice was aggressive. But the Lord whispered, now, now go ahead and go witness to him. And I wanted to just fall apart right there. Man, I'm sorry, Lord. Was he <coughs> with me? And I'm telling you, from that day on, that changed my whole attitude about publicly addressing people. 
while I'm behind the wheel. It, it really did. It changed my whole. You will not catch me yelling out the window anymore. You won't. You just won't. I mean, that convicted me so much that I said, that's it. I mean, I was so embarrassed. But it wasn't that God just showed up at the right time. The Holy Spirit was always there with me and listening to what was coming out of my mouth. And then he challenged me, is that a glorifying thing to do? And I said, you're right. What am I thinking? And so I began, and so we're always maturing. We're desirous to mature. But the Holy Spirit, the teacher, he's being revealed now. He's always been here, but he's being revealed in Acts chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit, the teacher, is bringing the understanding of this figurative speech. Jesus was saying, a time is going to come where you're going to understand what I'm saying. And Acts chapter 2 was that time. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Peter, quoting Joel 2.28, Peter speaking to a large group, saying, It shall come to pass in the days, says God, that I will pour out of my pour out of my spirit on all flesh. God the Holy Spirit, the teacher, is revealing himself through Peter's words, and Peter now filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, went on and proclaimed the deity of Jesus Christ. In other words, proclaimed, this man that you crucified, he is God. And when Peter finished his sermon, 3,000 people repented and pledged their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. 3,000 people. In this sanctuary right now, we've got 125 to 130 people. This whole sanctuary holds, we have 250 chairs sitting on the floor. 3,000 people came to the Lord. Are we getting a reference of that? That's a lot of folks, amen. 3,000 stood up and said, man, I'm cut to the heart. What do I need to do to be saved? You need to repent, confess your sins, and ask Jesus into your life. And 3,000 people did that. Was that because Peter's speech was so eloquent and so well put together by this working man? No. The power of the Holy Spirit went out and touched 3,000 people, and they responded. Have you responded this day to the touch of God's Holy Spirit? Have you received that personal relationship with God which is only found through the finished work of Jesus Christ? That's what this pulpit represents. That and that's it. That's it. That's all this pulpit represents. No longer were these people placing their hope in the feeble sacrificial works. It was a new covenant. No longer were they able to or desirous to hide their rebellious hearts, they knew that God the Father knew what was inside. They knew. Finally, now the coming into the presence of their Father, they were open with nothing to hide, being accepted as sons and daughters. How does that sound? Pretty good. The creator of the universe accepting you and I as sons and daughters? Are you kidding me? It sounds pretty overwhelming, but it's true and we know that. It is finished. Again, I ask, do you have that relationship? This new relationship will take time to develop because Jesus goes on in addressing his disciples in verse 26. He says, in that day, in other words, the, the day that's to come, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. This is becoming very personal now by the words of Jesus. Because he loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world, and again, now, currently, in other words, I shall leave the world and go to the Father. 
In other words, Jesus is saying, right now, you can't understand what I'm telling you. I'm speaking to you in what you consider this figurative speech. You, you consider I'm speaking to you in parables. You can't understand these spiritual things right now. But in that day, when it comes, when the understanding comes, the words I speak to you now will be brought back to you by the Holy Spirit. And then you will begin to mature in this new relationship. You know, when we become born again, that's only the beginning of our journey. We went down last night to the U-Turn for Christ in Paris, the U-Turn for Christ ranch. And it's a, a men's ranch that we go to a few times a year. And I'm blessed, and, and, and Calvary Chapel, we've, we've committed to several times a year to head down to U-Turn. And any, any, men, any of the men present are, are welcome to come join me on our, on our dates. But I was blessed this time. We were able to go down last night with the band I play in, the Lifters. And the Lifters are just a straight-ahead Christian rock band. And I love these cats. It's a three-piece band. And they always remind me, they say, you're not hitting the drums hard enough. We want to hear you. I'm like, yeah, I found a home. And I got these big, fat drumsticks. And I mean, I am just wailing. I'm like, I love you, Lord. Whoa. Whoa. I mean, we get the place on their feet, man. And, and we play at least a dozen dates a year and sometimes more, but we, we allow the Lord to work that out. But it's great. And I love going down to U-Turn because these are these guys, I mean, they're all tacked up and they got tattoos on their face and on their necks and every place of their bodies and, and things, and, and they're hardcore guys. And yet we're jamming away, lifting the roof on, the, on their sanctuary. And these guys, these tough guys, they're on their faces, man. The other half have their hands in their air, the, the air and tears are coming down their faces and other guys are on their knees and they're just like, man, Lord, you're so good. And we get the privilege of ministering to these guys. And we play music, good Christian hard rock music, they love it, and then we open up the Word. And I opened up the Word the other day and I said, guys, you're in a very... you're in the very early parts of your walk. Those of you that have received Jesus, those of you that have come here and received Jesus, you're very early in your walk. And I let them know, I said, you know, after eight weeks, some of you guys are going to go home. And that's when the battle is going to begin. I mean, you're here in a safe place. You know, the U-Turn for Christ Ranch, I mean, their whole day, every minute of their day is sectioned out. Hey, at, at uh, 6.05, this is where you're going to be. And at 6.15, you're going to be here. And at 6.35, this is what's happening. 8.15, on and on and on. I mean, their whole day is scheduled. So it's a no-brainer. But I reminded them last night, guys, you're going to leave this ranch someday. You're going to leave this security blanket. Because it's easy to walk around and say, hey, praise the Lord while we're all in one accord, but pretty soon you're going to be heading home. And guess what? Just as Pastor was teaching Friday night, all of a sudden everything that you used to pay for is going to become free. All the narcotics that you used to pay for, you know, for a season they're going to be offered to you for free. All the other fleshly activities, I'll let you fill in the blanks. The things you used to pay for or hunt out, they're going to come find you. We don't have an enemy that's stupid. We have an enemy that hates you and I. We have an enemy that wants to destroy us. Why? Because we're a witness for Christ. And you are primary A number one target in his book. Don't kid yourself. So as I reminded them, say, fellas, when you leave here, you had better get to the church that God is calling you to get to. And I helped them, we gave them resources. You better get to that church and you better find that men's study and you better get fat right in the middle of that thing quick. Amen. And you better get a list of phone numbers and you better get a list of email addresses and you better start maturing fast. You do that through the church. You don't do that with your old neighborhood buddies. And so I reminded them of that. Hey, you guys are having a great time and we, and we encourage that. <sighs> But this is your security blanket. You turn for Christ is your security blanket. Is Calvary Chapel Harupa Valley your security blanket? 
Because we're going out those doors in about another 10 minutes, another 15 minutes. That's where the battle is, right up there. It's not here. We're hallelujah and high fiving and praising the Lord and blessing one another. Yeah, it's all good. But we're heading out that double door here shortly. And we need to be maturing from this moment on. Every year, I get with the worship musicians that I've worked with throughout the year, and I'm just so blessed. I mean, I'm blessed to be me. I'm almost embarrassed to be me. I got it so good. Do you find the same thing in your life? I mean, God is so good. I mean, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed sometimes. Like, man, Lord, are you kidding? All this and heaven, too? <laughs> I mean, I have a hard time understanding it. My pea brain. But the Lord says, yeah, you're mine. I'm like, thank you. And I'm one of those guys on my face, and tears are coming out of my eyes, and I'm praising the Lord. <laughs> But every year when I, I get with me, at the end of the year, around Christmas time, I get with all the, the worship musicians, and I ask them, I said, I ask them a simple question. They say, yes or no answer. It's not complicated. I'm a simple guy. I still kickstart my motorcycle. It's cool. <laughs> a guy sends me a picture of his motorcycle the other day. It's not a motorcycle, let me tell you that. But he's got a, a thermometer on his, in his fairing or something. I don't know what it is. I said, what is that? Oh, it's my thermometer. You're going to be kidding me. I thought you had a motorcycle. <laughs> but I asked the, 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 the musicians that I work with once a year, I said, are you a better musician? It's the end of the year. Answer yes or no. Are you a better musician? And overwhelmingly, every time I've asked, every year I ask, the, the answer is generally, yes, I am. And I'm excited. I'm like, great. You've got a great talent that God has given you. And you've been working hard at getting it better through His grace. You didn't take that talent and bury it in the, in the dirt and hope something would happen with it. You've been working hard. And so I'm grateful. So I asked, hey, are you a better musician? Yes, I am. Great. You're a gift to this church, and you're giving that gift to us. Isn't that a blessing? The same thing applies as we're going to look at, we have to be introspective today. Are you born again? And if the answer is yes, then I want to ask you, are you more of a mature Christian a year ago? Are you planning on being more of a mature Christian in 2016? Is that your desire? Are you positioning yourself, asking the Lord, Lord, how do I accomplish it? I mean, God will do it. But if you're shining the Lord on or turning your back on God, He's not going to work in your life. So you're not going to become a more mature Christian. We have to answer these questions. And Jesus is saying, hey, there'll be a time that you're going to develop in the things that I'm speaking and teaching to you. There'll be a time when this becomes obvious, but right now it's way over your head. You don't have a clue. Are we desiring to mature in our walk, or are we just sitting on the bench? Understand, the guys that are off the bench in the game, they're the only guys that are striking out. Those are the only guys that are fouling. Those are the only guys that are making errors on the field. But you know what? The guy sitting on the bench, he's got a clean uniform, clean stats, because he hasn't done anything. He's done absolutely nothing. The guys that come in and, man, I struck out. I say, hey, man, at least you were in the game. Man, I fouled out. Hey, at least you were in there trying to contribute. Hey, man, I dropped that, that loaded grounder, man. Hey, at least you were trying. Let's go back and work on that next time. Let's have some, some infield practice then. That was a hot potato, so let's, let's work on that. That's where I'm weak. I'm weak in that. I took my eyes off the ball. I need to be trained. Help me, coach. Train me. And that's where our quick Christian walk has to be. How are we positioning ourselves to mature? That question I leave with you individually. We come on Sunday and throw our Bible in the back of the car and say, see you next Sunday. A lot of people, a lot of us do that. You know, there's a lot of great things going on Monday through Friday. A lot of great things. Get involved. 
But Jesus is saying, hey, right now you guys don't get this stuff, but it will be brought back by the Holy Spirit. It will become relevant when he reveals himself to you. He's here, but he hasn't revealed himself to you. And when the Father pulls the triggers, in other words, he'll reveal himself to you as Peter experienced. Peter got it. He got it. And filled with the Holy Spirit, he preached. And 3,000 people responded. Peter is now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, maturing in his walk. This is the guy that was in the game and he fouled out by denying Christ. But Jesus told him, hey, Peter, Satan has asked for you specifically, but when you return, feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, I'm praying for you. We need to understand that. That's one of the most tender verses I've ever read. Peter, I'm praying for you. Victory in Jesus. Let's receive that. So the disciples at this point, as we're getting ready to close, the disciples are kind of now kind of getting it. Because they respond to Jesus in verse 29. See, Jesus, now you are speaking plainly. So it appears that God the Father maybe just opened up their eyesight just a sliver. Because they're saying, oh, now we're kind of getting it. You're speaking to us plainly. In other words, we're starting to understand. And you're using no figure of speech. You're no longer speaking in parables. Now, they continue, we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Hey, we got it. We're super Christians now, Jesus. We got it made in the shade. And how does Jesus respond? Well, very sarcastically. Very sarcastically in verse 31. Do you now believe? Really? You got that brilliant that fast? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and you will leave me alone. You know, when the bullets start flying, you super Christians, Jesus is saying, you're all going to split. You're gone. And we understand that. And as Pastor continues to finish the book of John, God willing, the Gospel of John, we're going to see that. We're going to see that scatter. Oh, Jesus, I'd do anything for you. Well, proclaim, proclaim I'm, I'm the Messiah. Well, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> you will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. If you get nothing else out of today's teaching, I mean this. If you get nothing else out of this, understand that the Father is with you. His thoughts for you are good. They are not thoughts of evil. They are thoughts of good and bad. The Father is with me, Jesus saying. So I, I desire you guys don't scatter, but I know you're going to. You're going to physically leave me alone. But God the Father, who is to be worshipped in spirit and truth, he will be with me. And with that, I will press on. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Doesn't that sound nice? Yeah. You're struggling. You're fighting. I ran from the Lord for over 20 years, 22 some years. I fought the Lord the whole time. Man, it was a battle. I was tired. And I walked into this Calvary Chapel and, and that day Pastor Jim opened up his notes. I'll never forget this. He had his notes. Everything was laid out. His Bible was open. He was getting ready to to bring his teaching, and I just saw him, and he closed his notes and said, the Lord is telling me to give my testimony today. And I'm sitting right out here, and I'm thinking, oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> and Pastor gave his testimony as he's been giving over the last several weeks, and when, the, when Pastor was done, I'm sitting there thinking, this guy's a pastor? <laughs> what? And the second I said that in my mind, the Lord said, that's correct, and now Greg, you have no excuses. Mm. <laughs> and he, the Lord, I said, I, and right there, I gave up. I said, I quit. I give up. I give up. You win. No. I mean, his life was exactly, my life was being verbalized from the point. I thought, my goodness. Everything he's been engaged in is exactly what I've been engaged in, and I allowed that to be a stumbling block. I, I knew God didn't want me. Because I was a hoodlum. I did all these things. Oh, God doesn't want me. But yet, from the pulpit, 
by the inspiration of the Spirit. I mean, he closed his nose. I'll never forget. He shut his nose. I'm giving my testimony this morning. Where is it that you're at today? What is it that God's speaking to you about? Is it a, the simple fact of just coming to the Lord? And I don't mean ju just, but that's the beginning. Do you need to start the process? Do you need to come to Jesus this morning? We're going to give you that opportunity to do so. Those of you that are with the Lord, are you striving to mature in your relationship? I don't know. But God knows. The boys will scatter from Jesus, but the Father is with him. He's with you and I. And in verse 33, as we close, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Can anyone verify that in your life? We have tribulation. Praise the Lord. Pastor Vince comes walking in the door this morning, kind of just shaking his head. He says, it's every Sunday, isn't it? And like, what are you talking about, bro? Are you okay? Yeah, I walked out, jumped in the car, flat tire. It was fine last night. Everything was great. It was fine Monday morning. But Sunday morning, flat as a pancake. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus is offering. Yeah, I've overcome. I am your peace. All those who are weary and heavy laden, come. I will give you rest. Jesus is worth it. If I could ask the worship team to come join me, please. Where are you at this morning? There's only one or two places you're at. I'm telling you. You're either here wondering what this whole Calvary Chapel thing is all about, and you don't have Jesus, and so you you need to receive Jesus. Or you're here this morning and you need to mature in your walk. There's one or two catalogs of people. That's it. Very simple. So as we begin to worship and close out our service, I would give that invitation. Is there anyone here that needs Jesus Christ as Savior? Just simply put your hand up. We always want to give that opportunity. Is there anyone here this morning that needs Jesus Christ as Savior? <coughs> It's been clearly touched. Who else? Who else? We're going to lead. God bless you, bro. As we quickly wrap up, who else? And then we'll, we'll continue to move on. Now, brothers, you've heard the word this morning, and you allowed it to touch your hearts. It's not that the Holy Spirit has not been around you, but He has revealed Jesus Christ in your life. Just as Jesus was teaching the disciples that we looked at this morning, these guys began to begin to understand. It. And you men are doing the same exact thing. You've opened yourselves up to God's design and desire for your lives. And in that, we rejoice and we celebrate with you. I'd like to just take a moment, if you would, I'd like to leave you in what we call a sinner's prayer. And Paul the Apostle, and, and we'll talk about this a little more in detail, but in Romans 10, 9, and 10, the Apostle says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, in other words, what's in the heart comes out of your mouth, and if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, upon that confession, you are saved. That's scripture, and we'll look at that in a moment, uh, privately. <coughs> and so we want to give you this opportunity as you've been touched in your heart. And now I'll, I'd like to leave you in a sinner's prayer that we call it, quite simply just saying, Jesus, I believe, I receive, I turn from my sin, and I allow you to come into my, my heart. And so if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd leave you in that if you just repeat after me. Brothers, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for revealing who you are. You, Jesus, died on the cross to save me, and for that I am ever grateful. Jesus, at this time, I turn from my sin 
And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart. And because of your word, Romans 10, 9, 10, I confess these truths unto salvation. And I receive your finished work unto salvation. The glory be to God, my Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. So some of the guys, they've got some material for you. I want you to speak to some of these men. I'll likewise be available. Pastor Jim will be available. But we want to just take a minute of your time. It's not going to be a long day. We just want to get you plugged in to Calvary Chapel in Arupa Valley. We want to get you plugged in, plugged into the men's ministry and what's cooking on around here, okay? That's our only desire and, 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 and desire just to take a moment with you to get you acquainted with some of the great things that are going on. In the meantime... Grow in your relationship with the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Praise the Lord, and may the Lord reveal Himself once again in a mighty way to you, to you this week and allow the love of the Lord to generate out of the work of your hands, your feet, your mouth, your thinking, your prayer life. May He reveal Himself to you in a mighty way. Get involved and allow the Lord to work in your life. You'll be ever grateful. Join us by standing as we go out praising the Lord.